Can I ask? Okay, I'm going to call the meeting to order. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we are going to come back and do our normal consent agenda in a minute. We're going to put pause on it first. We're excited. We have a performance from Footloose. Our Footloose performers are here, which is an awesome preview because I'm already looking forward to Thursday. Um, and then right after that, we are going to have a presentation from um, some of our Okra students. So, and so we're going to stay in the audience and you guys can swap out. Um, Vivian, Lila, and Sophia are going to be presenting from, um, from Okra. So we're going to swap places with all of you and we're, thank, we're grateful you're here. Right, so I just wanted to just acknowledge our director, Elsa Parsley, here and our yeah. student performers. I want to say and, and thank you to Dean Madden and the Ho, I would say, ensemble uh, that has been responsible for preparing for the production. Um, I wanted to say I've had the pleasure of having my office right next to McLean <laughs> to see from uh, the, the day one of the read through, through the performance, to see the hard work and just the talent come through. And so everyone is excited, and this is a great opportunity to share with the community a preview of what's to come. So with that, we're going to move. I also just want to say that our vocal director this year is Zach Otieri, who is a 2014 ah. MHS grad. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. So, so there is life after the musical. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs>
bodies. Now, listen up. Mama said, What you believe? Always. And not believe that. She is right. <gasps> Mama said, If you've got doubts, well, ignore your own phone. It just means you're ready. Director of the Original Civic Research and Action Program, Joe Liberti. And so, Joe, why don't you come down with our three student presenters and just thank you for being here this evening. So, um, I would ask the board just to come down closer to me so we can use the microphone to ask questions. I'm going to ask you to present here and sit here as well. So good evening. So uh, again, let me reintroduce myself. I'm Joe Liberti. I'm a teacher in the social studies department. I'm the founder and director of Original Civic Research in Action. It's a four-year program, as you know, at the Merrimack High School. Uh, we're in the, I think, sixth year. Um, and the students behind me represent the third sort of senior cohort. Um, so it's been an exciting journey for everyone. Um, uh, the pandemic, as you can imagine, made it um, a bit more challenging to launch a new program. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it has given us a lot to think about and uh, really sort of forced me to, to, to sort of really model what it means to kind of iterate, um, to, uh, to pivot, as they say. Um, and I think in that sense, uh, the program uh, and the experience overall is, is, is really better. Um, so with that, uh, this group here, which you've heard before, um, has uh, made their OCA initiative really about sort of systems change. Um, 
And that's really, of course, research driven. And that's really the key to the OCRA program. It's giving students an opportunity to sort of have a um, problem solving framework and then having them sort of let the curiosity and interest drive them in the direction of a particular issue or need that really comes from within. In that sense, it's very much student-centered. Uh, and of course, it's about making those sort of connections with uh, community stakeholders, in this case, uh, in part, the board, central administration. Uh, in other cases, it's, it's making those sort of connections with the community, so where they have these sort of full-time uh, community mentors. Um, but uh, I've also been fortunate enough for people within the building um, to serve as quote unquote community mentors. Uh, one of them uh, is here tonight, uh, and that's Annie Ward. Uh, so I do want to thank her. Uh, she's been uh, really crucial to working with several groups. Um, and it's really with her guidance and uh, her ability to sort of think about that sort of process where one has to think about the data, how are we going to measure this, um, and then thinking about sort of the research methodologies. Um, so I do want to sort of say thank you, uh, particularly in light of the, the email I just read. Um, so, um, so with that, uh, I want to turn it over to the students. Obviously tonight they're coming back to present to you um, after having sort of uh, launched what I think is a, you know, a very successful systems change, but like all systems change, change is difficult. Uh, so in the spirit and really in the model of OCRA, they've gone back, uh, they've done a lot of data collection, uh, and they'll tonight give a chance to sort of talk about what they've done so far, uh, what the data tells them, uh, and then sort of next steps. So thank you. Hi, um, I'm Vivian uh, Loigman. I'm a senior in Okra. Um, so tonight we're really excited and grateful to have the opportunity to present about our dual stream recycling initiative. Um, last spring in May, we shared with the board our idea to transform the current recycling system at the high school, which was operating at a single stream system to a dual stream system. Um, single stream recycling is the process of putting all recyclables, whether that is paper and cardboard, and putting that together with plastics, aluminum cans, and bottles. And we realized through this system that we weren't obtaining the amount of recyclables that we wanted to in order to be sustainable within the district. So we decided to make a switch to dual stream recycling, which would allow us to separate our recyclables by bottles and cans with paper and cardboard to maximize the amount of recyclables we would have within the district and stay in line with our sustainability goals at the Maranek district and in the high school. So tonight we're going to be presenting what we have done for our education and outreach so far, what we have done to make faculty, student and staff, and everyone, parents in the district, aware of the system and what we want to, and to show our data and how we've been doing so far. So since October, we've had these bins implemented in all classrooms, not just classrooms, but in all the offices. So every building you walk into in the high school has two bins next to each other. One is the green bin, and that's for paper and cardboard. And then the other one is the blue bin for um, plastic bottles and cans, aluminum cans. Um, thanks to the Board of Ed and working with them and Mr. Brugge, we had the opportunity to get these special cans that have actual like slits that allow it to be really like obvious to students and to staff where to put each item, which we realized was a problem in the past. And this is where we started our education and outreach phase. We um, made sure to add lids that have are labeled with I which item goes where on the outside recycling bins and then within the classroom we made really like clear signage in order for students and staff to know where every item should be correctly placed <coughs> and when doing our education outreach we made sure to pay attention to our target audiences because each different group needs different um, informative information in order to get their points across so those are just some of our ideas and then we started with the best practices Google form, which is for the school custodians who have been critical in helping us to implement this system. So we have started our surveys with these custodial staff to know how they are feeling with the system so far and what changes they think that we can make in order to maximize the success of this program. We've also utilized Tiger Time. This is just one of our announcements that have gone up to the high school students and staff, and then we've also used Student and Parent Square to get our public announcements across. So in order to start measuring the success of our system and if our education outreach has been doing a good job getting our points across, 
we are starting to take part in an audit method. So in order to evaluate the success of this system, students in Okra from freshmen through seniors have had the opportunity to assist us with our data collection twice so far in January on the 13th and on the 26th. Students in all grades have had the opportunity to fill out this easy Google form for us and at the same time at the end of the building, three o'clock, they go into each classroom and record their findings in each room and report to us on their contamination levels. And not only has this provided us with really crucial data to see the success of our initiative, it's also allowed students to get involved and see kind of what it is we do day in and day out to make this program successful and kind of give them a light into it. So that's been really great. Hi, so I'm Sophia Rosenbaum. Um, so just to kind of continue with the data that we collected from our audits, which we did twice on the 13th and the 26th, like Vivi said, um, we noticed in just that span of two weeks that participation in the dual stream recycling within classrooms has increased um, in both the blue bins and the green bins, which you can see are labeled just green and blue in the chart. So you can see that more of the bins are being used in the classrooms. And there's also been less contamination in the bins in each type of bin, like compared in the second week compared to the first week, which has been really exciting to see that even in the span of two weeks, our program has been expanding. So we took some of the data and turned it into graphs. So to start, we have sources of contamination in the green bin, which is what has paper and cardboard. So we found that the majority of the contamination was from dirty and stained paper, which was 38%, and then non-paper and non-cardboard items, over half, 52%, which should not have been in, in that bin. And only 10% of that contamination was from wet cardboard. And that was interesting for us to note in order to see what types of um, announcements we need to make in the future to educate students and faculty about how to recycle properly. Um, I'm Lila, I'm the last member of this group. Um, so through our data, we were able to, through these audits, we were able to get a real breakdown of what the contamination looked like, even though it was limited. Um, so this, this allows us to kind of um, evaluate what we need to focus more on our education and outreach. Um, so those same, um, these biggest sources of contamination from the blue bins is coming from papers and cardboards, which is meant to be in the green bins, and the dirty or soiled plastics, glass cans and bottles. Um, so we also noticed that there's one big contamination level that's straws. So we actually, this was a new thing that was brought to our attention that we needed to start to focus on because this is something that most students wouldn't be aware of as like they're um, very likely to, you know, uh, utilize the uh, convenience stores near us, so like Starbucks and the New Delhi across the street. Um, so this is something we've started to notice and we're going to prioritize moving forward with our education and outreach. Um, so similar to last year, we collected data based on the dumpsters that are uh, allotted outside the building, which is where all the um, garbage and recyclables are being moved to from the classroom bins. So our data shows that the dual stream recycling within the classrooms has dramatically reduced cross-contamination between uh, plastics, bottles, and cans, and paper. Um, and we also know that our weekly surveys of outside dumpsters specifically show high rates of utilization for paper and cardboard with little to no contamination, which is a really positive thing for us. Um, those same weekly surveys indicate low utilization of the cans and bottles dumpsters. Um, so with that, we want to further research um, to understand why there's a higher rate of clean recyclables within the blue classroom bins um, and underutilized cans, bottles, and dumpsters. Um, so our next steps is definitely um, to utilize the data that we've been collecting and to make sure that we're approaching this in the most effective way. So we're taking a three-pronged approach to our systems improvement. Um, so our first target is definitely to um, attack the additional out education and outreach. Um, so we want to make sure that we're educating students on proper recycling, which, is, which means producing more videos 
and um, content specifically, like I had mentioned, clarifying that plastic straws should not be recycled. Um, we are also aware that there is definitely some misconceptions about recycling being spread, um, specifically on the realisticness of how much of your recyclables are actually being recycled. Um, so we want to make sure that we can combat it by continuing our education me methods. Um, our next step is definitely working towards the hallway receptacles. So we're, we've noticed throughout our um, research within the building that there's not always necessarily three recycled three bins in every location. Sometimes we notice that there's only one trash can or only a trash can and uh, bottles and cans recycling uh, bin. So in order to make sure that we're being um, as effective as possible and that we can use utilize our best practices and making it most as efficient as possible, that we can have everything needed to make it as easy as possible for students. Um, including that, we're going to continue our data collection for all of our classroom bins as that's provided us with a lot of important data. Um, and we're going to continue our data collection for cans and bottles, dumpsters, and then we're going to launch our hallway garbage and recycling bins data collection. Um, and then I believe that's it. So if there's any questions, go ahead. Sure. Hi, how are you? First of all, thank you very much for doing this work. This is amazing work. Uh, you're seniors? Yes, we're all okay. seniors. So hopefully you'll have a successful end of school year and you will enjoy your summer before you head to your next adventure. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you if you were thinking at all of doing also some outreach and education at Homex, especially with the Green Tigers. Because as you know, like I think you were the third class that had the rocket in the hummocks, yeah. so you've been, you've been well aware of the projects there and the work. So that would be amazing if uh, outreach and education starts early, so this way they come to the high school ready to Yeah, absolutely. The so that was actually something we had talked about last year when we were first um, starting our first pitch to the board for, for this request. Um, we know that there's at, I think, almost every single elementary school, they utilize a dual stream system. So that was something we want to make sure we're being consistent with throughout the entire district, um, just so we're setting up good habits for uh, sustainability. But I think it, it would be amazing for the younger students to see the role model because uh, your work is amazing and to see like what does this mean when you uh, move to the high school. It's, uh, it's interesting and it's very, yeah. very uh, impactful. So Yeah, absolutely. We'll definitely look into that. I just want to say thank you. I love um, the, the reflective piece, and I think that that skill that you all really, really harnessed is, you know, it's, it's fascinating to be able to learn from you, sort of like the straws that yes. make total sense, but sort of the way that you are doing your diligence to understand my granular lover, because that's really how it changes me. So it's really exciting to see, and um, thank you. You are leaving our system forever improved. Um, in addition to where my work is to live on beyond your time here, so thank you. Thank you so much. I just wondered if you can share a bit about your why, why you chose this project and why you're passionate about it. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, we can come yeah. So um, obviously we understand that the pandemic has really taken a toll on all students and staff. It's made everything a lot more difficult. We started Okra freshman year, but that was during the very height of the pandemic. So we shut down mid-year and then we started up the beginning of our sophomore year, which is when we were doing half in, half out. So that was obviously added some difficulties, but we all have been through the district since kindergarten and it's sustainability has always been emphasized. and. In Chatsworth, we had a dual stream recycling system at all of our houses and within the community of Village of Larchmont and Mamaroneck, we utilize a dual stream system. And in the middle school, we also utilize one. So the sustainability habits we had set up from the time we were in kindergarten, we just, when we came to the high school, we realized that we wanted what we were learning all along to be finished throughout. We already had the knowledge about it and we knew it was important to us for students who come through the district to see how their recycling habits grow and how they stay sustainable, sustainable throughout their whole experience in the district. And this has been really rewarding for us, so thank you so much for allowing us to do this. We're really grateful. Thank you very much. Very impressive work. Thank you. Hi. Um, I love that you guys 
not just collect the data, but collect the data that informed um, your next steps. Um, that was super interesting, and, and I loved seeing that. Um, I'm curious, does the high school compost, and if not, any plans to suggest that going down the road? Um, I believe that the high school has began to compost. I'm pretty sure it was an initiative that was also started pre-pandemic. Um, I'm not sure how much it's currently being utilized. It's difficult because many high school students don't actually eat in the cafeteria, so it's hard to have like one central area of composting. But we would love to look into that. We definitely started thinking about it before we reined in more on the dual stream, but it's something that's also important to us. So we hope to, in the end of our senior year, to look more into it. Awesome. Let us know how we can support. Thank you. So can I ask a, a, just a question about this experience in the program? I mean, I would say um, as a superintendent and certainly having the opportunity to uh, think about this program and support Mr. Liberty and the students, what intrigued me is that um, this was about really understanding this kind of construct of civic engagement and responsibility. And so it would be great to, now that as seniors, <clears throat> um, maybe take a few minutes to share what this program has meant to you in terms of how it's maybe influenced your thinking about civic responsibility. There's been a lot of conversation publicly about do we teach civics, you know, and what I appreciate about your experience in this program is that you're not only learning about it, but you're doing it. And so maybe what is the distinction between learning and doing and understanding and activating that learning that maybe you can share? Um, yes, it's definitely been a really fulfilling experience in the Okra program, kind of different from other classes where we learn material and it of course can have real world applications, but in Okra we are actually, that's the point, is that we are applying it to real issues in the community. And even the summer work that we did a few times was to interview community stakeholders about their role in the community and various problems. And I remember talking to a variety of different people, um, Peggy from the League of Women Voters, and I spoke to the head of the Mamaroneck Library. And it was just really cool hearing from a lot of different people about their roles in the community. And we spent a long time narrowing down our topic and speaking a lot about Love Your Food and with um, also the Hunger Task Force and just sort of narrowing down what we were doing. And we have a big part of Okra is that we have mentors. So we have we were really fortunate to have three mentors to help us. And we met with them frequently to discuss like next steps and kind of just how we could further our process, which was really helpful to have advisors and have support, which just was really super helpful. And it was just really exciting also, of course, to have the support of the board and the administration in being able to present our initiatives and our goals and actually see them be accomplished was really exciting. Sorry, a board member is at home, Sally Cantwell, and she texted me her question. Of course, she's like impressed by all your work and your dedication, and she's very grateful. Um, Sally was involved in MSF when the, the rocket got introduced to Homex, so that's a big passion of hers. So she's asking you, have you looked at the back end once the recycling leaves the building? Um, yeah, so that's definitely something Thank we you. are looking at because we want to make sure that we're actually seeing the entire process like from start to finish. Um, so that's kind of why we're looking at these uh, dumpsters and we, sp we speak to Suburban Carding Semi frequently to learn about like when the pickup schedules are so we make sure that we're monitoring everything before it's, before it's actually leaving the building so we can see everything from start to finish. So yes. Final comments from the board, from the audience. Joe, would you like to just? So just quickly, if, um, if I come back to uh, Dr. Shap's question. Um, so as students have said, you know, it really is about real world application it's about problem solving. Um, 
not theoretically, not conceptually, although theory has its place and, and whatnot. Um, but it's really, again, taking that sort of research process, understanding a problem, understanding how to problem solve, uh, and beginning to embrace the messiness of that uh, under the guidance of CUNY mentors. Um, and I have to say, um, uh, I was working after school uh, with some of the students, um, just kind of you know, reviewing their presentation. And I said to, I asked one of them, I said, you know, what's it like to co-create with a teacher? She kind of, that kind of took her back for a second. She was like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I'm, not, I'm working with you. Like, I'm not, I'm, we're equals here. What's that feel like um, compared to other classes? Um, you remember your comment? You remember your response? I'm going to put it on the spot. Yeah. This, well, after the day, I'm saying, hey, it's a good co creator. Sorry. Yeah. I think in essence she was saying it's, 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 it's such a radically different, I'm going to you know, sort of yeah. paraphrase her, but what a radically different experience to, to, to work with a teacher in a way that you really, we really are co-creators in the program. Whether it's the community mentors, whether it's me, um, it's not, I'm not standing and delivering. Um, I am not driving the inquiry. They are. Um, they are ultimately the, the, the problem solvers. Um, and so to me, um, this is really what public ed education should be. Um, it should be, you know, what I hope Oprah can be. Uh, because ultimately, back to Bob's point, and that is, if we're going to create engaged active citizens, we can't have them passive for four years and then launch them out in the community and be like, go vote, <laughs> as if that's enough. Um, and so I guess I would just like to end by just again, once again, thanking um, the superintendent, all the uh, assistant superintendents, uh, as well as the board for supporting OCRA. Um, and I hope that uh, this is just you know, one you know, example of the great work that can be done uh, when young people are given the opportunity. So thank you. And, and we want to thank you because this is the living example of real learning. And we're so grateful that programs like this exist here in the Merrimack. And it's such a point of pride for us um, and such a joy to see living and breathing. Um, so thank you for really bringing this to life and helping educate in the most profound sense of the word. Thank you. be removed from the consent agenda. Note, if a board member wishes to remove an item on the consent agenda for further discussion, a motion to remove item from the consent agenda must be made. However, once a motion and second are made for, for the consent agenda, items listed below, simple questions can be asked regarding any of them, as you would normally do for individual resolutions. A, approval of minutes of the 124-23 uh, work session and business meeting and the Okay, so noted on board, board docs will be a change here. Approval of minutes of the 124-23 work session and business meeting and the 130-23 work session. <coughs> B, approval of personnel actions. C, approval of budget transfer. D, approval of contracts. E, acceptance of arrangements for appropriate special programs and services as recommended by CSE CPSE. F, authorization to declare certain items obsolete or relocated. Recommended action that the Board of Education approves the recommended consent agenda, items A through F, as listed on the attachments and above. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. 
Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, four, resolution. A resolution for an out-of-state trip. Recommended action that the Board of Education authorizes the superintendent of schools to approve the attached out-of-state trip for the high school softball teams to attend Ripken Experience Spring Classic in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina during spring vacation. They have a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. B, resolution for award of contract for Universal Pre-K Program 2023. Now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Maranek Union Free School District authorizes the school district administration to enter into contract with Healthy Kids programs for the provision of Universal Pre-K Program in the accordance with the terms and conditions of the school district's request for proposals subject to the preparation of an agreement approved by council. Now therefore be it further resolved that the Board of Education authorizes the superintendent or assistant superintendent for business operations to execute an agreement on behalf of the Board of Education. May I have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. C. Aye. C. Resolution for award of contract elementary school summer program 2023. Now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of Maranek Union Free School District authorizes the school district administration to enter into contract with the STEM Alliance for the provision of elementary school summer program in accordance with the terms and conditions of the school district's request for proposals subject to the preparation of an agreement approved by council. Now therefore be it further resolved that the Board of Education authorizes the superintendent or assistant superintendent for business operations to execute an agreement on behalf of the Board of Education. May I have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We had our report from OCRA students, and now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Thank Jess. you. Um, I just want to note <clears throat> for the audience and certainly for the board <clears throat> that as part of the personnel agenda, the consent agenda, um, the board accepted the letter of retirement of Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, Ms. Annie Ward. I want to say to Annie publicly, and I know that there'll be ample time to uh, reiterate my message, that certainly um, after an incredible 19-year service to the Maranek Public Schools, that I just want to say thank you, congratulate you on your retirement. Um, it's clear to me, and I had the opportunity to inform our staff that for the last 19 years you have been the North Star for curriculum, for instruction, for teaching and learning. And um, I, I think you have never lost that sense of joy of teaching from your middle school classroom days and you've carried that throughout your work. And I, I say this sincerely, that there is no program or, or initiative that currently exists that you have not had a hand in and shaped. Um, to the betterment of the experience of students and staff. More so, um, I think we're very proud in Mamaronek of our professional culture, and I think a lot of that is attributed to your commitment to excellence and your belief that teachers are not born, but they're made. And the work that goes into the fabric of supporting the growth of teachers and educators and the belief in the importance of that work is at the core of what you believe and represent. So. I want to say thank you um, for everything you've done. I know it's not over. Um, there'll be much more to talk about and celebrate, but just from my vantage point, it's been a privilege to be able to partner with you, and the, really the contribution to this uh, system is immeasurable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. And thank you for our partnership and, and to the entire board for, our, for your leadership and your support. Much more to come in, in the next five months, but thank you very much. Yeah, and, and um, I was just going to say something on behalf of the board, um, which is also going out to the community, but I also want to say here, uh, Annie has been a member of the Maranek Schools community since 2004. Throughout her 19 years, she's demonstrated professionalism and helped evolve the professional practice of countless teachers and administrators in our district. She's also established herself as a mentor to many, building teachers' confidence, sharing her knowledge, and helping teachers feel adept and confident to bring their skills and knowledge into the classrooms. Annie's an avid learner herself, always seeking to expand her knowledge and share it with others. She's also a recognized leader and published author in the field of literacy. Without question, she's made a lasting impact in our district and in the lives of our students. We wish her all the best in her retirement and are grateful for her tenure in the Maranac. Um, okay, so, with that, I think we're going to move on to our budget overview presentation. Okay. I keep thinking 
that all the time. <laughs> Every time they sit here, it will be the most memorable <laughs> meeting of all time. Go down. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. So I'm here tonight to present the uh, preliminary financial budget information. We're not, I don't have anything about program here. It's all financial and just kind of give you an idea of where we are. I'm um, actually, I finalized it today. And um, here we go. So just to share with you the enrollment um, that is projected for next year at each school. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of change from school to school, but overall, it's in the total, it's expected to stay um, steady. Uh, as you can see, you know, atomics will go up a little bit and some others will go down a little bit, but overall, um, there's not an expected significant change in total enrollment. Just to remind you, because I'm going to talk about some of the components, um, the how the um, tax levy is calculated we take the expenditure budget and then from that subtract all of the other revenues that we have um, interest income sales tax state aid and then that tells us what the required tax levy is we divide that by the assessments and that comes from the state the assessments come from the town here and uh, multiply by 1000 that gives us the tax rate per thousand of assessed value. So for the coming budget, which is based, the taxes are based on the 2022 assessment, which provides the calculation for the 23-24 taxes. So it was always a year behind. You can see the assessments have gone up significantly. It's no surprise the market value of homes have gone up significantly. Um, so this is representing about a 6.8% increase. And that this number can change um, until the tax rate is set in August. It will change. It shouldn't change significantly, but it will change. And this increase of assessments of $668 million will cause a decrease in the tax rate just because of the math, but it will not likely cause a de decrease in your tax bill. So just to be clear, the tax rate will go down significantly based on this, but the tax bill to each homeowner will not. This is the calculation of the tax levy cap. And um, I know it's hard to see a little bit, but if you have it in front of you. <coughs> Um, it starts with the 22-23 tax levy, and then we get a tax-based growth factor, which is provided by the state, that gives us a little bit um, more. It's a multiplied, um, use that as a multiplier of the tax levy from the current year. We add in the payment in lieu of taxes because that's considered tax income for us. Uh, and then from that, we subtract the capital tax levy. The tax levy that is required to pay our capital expenditures, not the, not the actual projects, but the bond and debt service, annual bond and debt service, that is outside of the tax levy cap, so that's why we take it out for the current year and then add it back for the ensuing year. And we apply the lesser of 2% or CPI. So clearly 2% <laughs> is going to be in this calculation this year. And then subtract what we get in payment in lieu of taxes. And that gives us our current year tax levy limit to which we add the tax levy required for capital costs for debt service. And that gives us our allowable tax levy prescribed under the tax levy cap law. The allowable increase that will be allowed for this year is $3.5 million for 2.62%. We also, in addition to um, the tax levy, we have increasing revenues from other sources. Um, incre interest income, the budget increase is about 164,000 or almost 200% due to the increasing interest rates and that may go up even more. 
the sales tax budget is increased by 250,000 or almost 10% due to inflation, internet sales, and legalized gambling. And state aid foundation, state foundation aid is expected to increase by $1.8 million. That is based on the governor's budget. It's not based on the past state budget. We won't know that um, likely till April 1st. But based on the governor's budget, the increase in state aid is $1.8 million in foundation aid. So just to talk about a few of our cost centers, um, our teachers' retirement system, um, pension expense, we pay that, we pay into the teacher's retirement system for all certified staff and that the rate for the current year is 10.26%. The rate for 23-24 is projected to be 9.76%. So that will go down even though the salaries are going up, but the overall will go down. The health insurance, um, as you can see, we break that out by the buyout amount, the premiums, the Medicare Part B reimbursements to retirees, and our Affordable Care Act costs. Um, there are unknowns in this budget. If those are the employee contributions and plan changes. The budget for the premiums has either gone down or stayed the same in 2021, 21, 22, 22, 23. And we're hoping that we can make some plan changes to enable the rates to hold for 23, 24. Transportation. As you recall, we brought transportation in-house um, last year, last February, the transportation management, not the busing. And uh, even before that, we were starting to write some of our own routes. And um, we, are, we have been able to reduce the number of buses from 42 to 38. Um, we are currently transporting to 57 schools, and we are transporting 526 students. Um, the, um, we also provide public transportation for um, bus passes and Metro North passes to high school students attending non-public schools. And the bus contract, if you recall, we extended, uh, the, the voters approved a five-year extension uh, last year. So we are not looking to go out to bid again. Um, and the current contractor will be able to raise their rates by CPI. That CPI is set in May. It's not the same CPI that we use for the tax levy cap. So um, we're just kind of FYI. We have um, one student with bus passes that we pay for, but we do buy many bus passes at the school discount that we sell to people for a lower rate than they can get through Beeline Bus. But the one we're providing is one, and 27 children are getting train passes um, from us to attend schools either in Greenwich or um, elsewhere. So this is our biggest unknown. We have four out of five of our collective bargaining um, contracts that are expiring in June. So it, it makes it a little bit difficult to budget, but um, we're doing our best. So just to let you know, all but the AIDS, the AIDS expire in the following year and just creates some significant unknowns. One of the cost centers that's quite disturbing this year is um, the, or the energy cost. As you can see, how significantly they've gone up um, over the past few years, not gas, but electric. So you will see a budget transfer on the February 28th um, board agenda to address this, and um, we're keeping an eye on it. And this is the calendar for our budget um, season. Um, we will, um, Dr. Shapps will present the superintendent's recommended 23-24 budget on March 7th with discussion then as well as March 21st and April 11th. The adoption of the 23-24 budget and property tax report card will be on April 18th with a public hearing on May 2nd and the budget vote by the taxpayers on May 16th. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions?
Can you remind me again how the TRS uh, is calculated, the percentage? So the TRS for the current year um, is ten, the percentage is 10.26 percent. It, this percentage is set by the state, and it is applied to the salaries and earnings of all certified staff. So teachers, administrators. So, so they already. Pro so the projected one is the <coughs> the one they kind of sent to you as like this is what we think is coming. Right. Forward. They'll they'll confirm it in a couple of months. Um, because TRS is actually on the same fiscal year as we are. ERS goes April to March, like the state. Mm -hmm. So they will confirm it, but that is the rate that they have provided to us, and they're usually fairly accurate. And that rate is built on a five-year return average? Uh, that's correct. So I, mean, I don't know if that's yes, what you're... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's that's what I was yeah. To yeah because you have years that are good and bad, so they do a five-year average. But it is completely you know, state-mandated rate. We don't control that rate at all. The last question I had for you is, the public hearing date is, is set by the state like that, that we do it after we the, the board approves, right? Because that's it, always the question that the community has, why? Yeah. It's a really, it's a misnomer, right? It's, yes. not, it's not really the time to come and address issues, but it is a date that we are required by New York State to have as a public hearing where you state the amount of the budget and you move on. But really, the discussion time are the dates in March. Thank you. Um, Sylvia, what are the projected enrollments based on? What data are we using? So the data is, um, Jesse Dancy covers that enrollment, and I would think it's based, the kindergarten enrollment is based on live births, and the um, enrollment in future years is based on previous years and previous trends. So since there's a, a decrease at the elementary school level, would we expect that in a few years down the road there's going to be a general decrease in total enrollment? Sure. So we, right prior to the pandemic, we actually um, had hired a demographer to give us a long-term forecast because I, I think the difficulty historically in the community is that we would see, really for the last 15 years, a pattern of alternating decline and gains around kindergarten cohorts. Um, so when we went through, um, we, we have been, as Sylvia alluded to, using a forecasting model for kindergarten, but it was the demographer's report that really predicted, I would say, the, the near-term trajectory of enrollment change. At the time, pre-COVID, there was a, a sense by his report, and we can share it again with the board and the community, that we were going to see a continuing trend of increased enrollment. However, the, the post-pandemic or in the midst of the pandemic and as we emerge, there has been a significant shift in thinking because we've seen two consecutive years of smaller kindergarten cohorts. So that, that is what I would say a, a significant change in terms of pattern of predictive measures that really leaves us in some ways almost like the sense of unknown about the, the future. Um, I will say in, in my report, and I can just say, I was going to mention where we are in kindergarten in re registration now for about 250, I would say, families that have initiated the, the process, which again, in looking at a recent pattern of registration, we're ahead of where we have been in the last two years. So, but I think the, we still have several large cohorts, the 450, 475, traveling through the system. And so I think it's safe to say the high school is on track to grow over the next couple of years to be the largest it, it has been in decades, around approaching 1,800. So back in <clears throat> 2010, it was at 1,350. Now it's 1,800 with the sigma change. Homics has gone from 1,000 students or 950 to about 1,300. And where we're seeing the most significant change is the elementary patterns. Chatsworth has had this, the largest drop in enrollment. They were in 2015, 730, almost 750. Now they're well under 700. So it's hard to predict is the long answer to your question. Does that help? I'm curious too, it sounds like we use kindergarten to predict growth a bit, and I'm wondering if, is, it, could it be that the pattern shift is that we're seeing the growth at all levels instead of just the kindergarten enrollment? So, like, our, our net change, I mean, so, so 
we, we've historically, our summer enrollment period is unpredictable, but it's predictable. It's predictable in the sense that we, we certainly have a consistency of summer, high summer enrollment. We don't know what that kind of, I would say, spread will be relative to each level. And so it's hard to say, will our enrollment grow based on, our process is very simple. We roll over existing students, mm -hmm. and then we forecast for kindergarten. Okay. And that's how we deal with projections that. Um, we learn between now and June, we have new arrivals, we have people who make decisions to move and or go to, to private school. But we relatively, we don't see significant change overall. So I, I would say is that, yeah, we, we predict what HOMEX is going to be, and we're typically off, and that's why I report the first day of school where we are at. But it's, it's pretty, our level of confidence around what that's going to be is, is pretty accurate relative to the lived experience of actual enrollment. Can I add something to that? Sure. So we're not basing it based on kindergarten. So what happens, and there's a term for it, which I just can't get my head on. But basically, we know that X percent of our fifth grade graders go to sixth grade. So we do that on a several year average. And that's how we predict if we have 100 children in sixth but fifth grade. And we know that it's 102 percent, we'll have 102 in sixth grade, or if it goes lower, the same thing. So we're not basing anything on kindergarten except kindergarten. Okay. Every grade has a cohort, it's a cohort survival ratio yes. thing. <laughs> so that, that's, so we use that to determine the potential or projected enrollment for each grade. Um, can you speak a bit about the experience this year with the in-house management of transportation? How's that worked out? It's been fabulous. <laughs> um, well, Lidju Thomas is our supervisor of transportation, and you know what's really been fabulous is it's been quiet. Um, he, and he has, during the slow time, taken on some really great other projects that have been very helpful, both to the registration office and to facilities office. Um, but he has. Um, you know, we, he, we routed everything on TransFinder. We um, have combined buses. We have um, consolidated stops, you know, within reason. And he is there to pick up the phone when the parents are calling. Um, he, he is responsive. And it's, it's just been a wonderful transition. And just one last question about the energy costs you mentioned. You said that's coming back to the board for discussion? No, it's, there'll be a budget transfer on the February 28th um, agenda to help us pay the increased cost for the remainder of the year. Okay, but how are we looking at this and looking to manage it moving forward? Well, we actually are working on an energy performance contract, um, and that will be before the board as well. Those on the building committee um, have been working on that. It is actually right now out for an RFP, and the RFP will be due back in a couple of weeks. Um, we had several contractors come through um, the district to, because when you do an energy performance contract, you don't say, we want to bid for this work. You say, what work do you think will help us improve energy efficiency and get the cost back? Because an energy performance contract must be self-sustaining. So if it's going to cost us a million dollars a year, it must save us a million dollars a year. So the companies then propose what, what work to do. And we say, OK or not OK. So we've been working on that with them. We also joined a cooperative for gas, which is the only thing keeping gas in check this year. Um, it's, it's been tremendous. So we started that um, not right at the beginning of the year, but a little bit into the year. So that's been tremendous. Um, you know, Our purchasing agent worked on that at length to get, that, to get us involved with that. If I could just add, um, I, I think historically managing the costs associated with energy has been a challenge. Um, though you look at actuals and history, there has to be some flexibility. I would say to Sylvia's credit, and th the bigger challenge now is that there's so much uncertainty around changes in price structures that is really not known to us because we, they just inform us with short notice when there's adjustments in costs. So it's how do you look at actuals and historicals but give the sense of flexibility in the budgeting to react to, and we have had a very mild winter. 
Um, the, the wild card that typically keeps us up at night is that if we had sustained periods of cold temperatures, that would further challenge just the utilization and energy and our budget adjustment around that. So it's something that Silver reports on because there's a marked increase, but I think in a normal year, we are always paying attention, right, to variance in actual you know, costs yes. associated with it. Yeah. Once we get to like October, we're do, I have budget status we do every, I do every month. And so I, I know, you know, or I think I know, I'm trying to project. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Um, no. Superintendent's report? Sure. So just a couple. I, you mentioned, um, and we, the board uh, voted to move forward on contracts for kindergarten and UPK. And I just want to just update um, the board and the community on the programs. Um, this is the first year uh, that I can remember of going through an RFP for um, kindergarten, uh, excuse me, pre-K. Um, program and uh, thank you to our members of the board, uh, both Andrine and Athena, who's, who participated in a, I would say, a fact-finding committee around uh, P UPK. The state and the governor has certainly made uh, what I would say a significant investment in UPK uh, for all. And I think our challenge this year was to understand the rules of the road, the change in funding. And then also kind of really make recommendations about program design. And so um, the, the RFP process produced three uh, prospective vendors. We had a, uh, an opportunity to interview them last week and really kind of understand what they had to offer. And we're excited by uh, certainly tonight that the board uh, certainly in, has, has provided the permission to engage in a contract with healthy kids who've been really managing pre-K programs across the southern tier, and I, I actually think in the Albany area for, for, for quite some time, and some very large school systems in the area. I, I think our next step in the process um, is that we're surveying interest from parents relative to our ability to kind of shift the program to a full day model. We know, I think just in conversation, that that is what uh, the state really is emphasizing and what parents we believe and families want um, to have the district uh, develop and support. So um, I would say this is a transition year relative to our thinking. We're hoping that with a new partner we can start to shape this program, generate interest, and really expand the available slots. Um, as the board knows, the variable of space limitation has really been a factor, and so we're trying to look across the system to see if we could build this program by utilizing space um, in different schools. So there's a lot to update the board and community. The first step was to kind of update, uh, provide an update to our families, start the registration process, come back to the board with a more, I'd say, fully developed plan. So that's where we are. Do you yes, have I mean. the, the hours that you're thinking of, like start and finish? So the, we, we, we discussed this, and we even discussed what is would be considered a full day program relative to the, the length of the, the program day. I think it's essential that what's worked well from my uh, perspective is having a staggered start. Um, one of the questions that we ask vendors um, is their ability to support a early morning drop off and a late extended day service as part of the UPK program that would really, I think, provide working families with an extended, you know, kind of experience around uh, before and after program um, child care coverage, which we're considering. So, it, all, I, I mean, my response to that question is that having a separate arrival and dismissal time that is not that's staggered, that's not with at the school, the general population of students supports logistically better because after all we have very yeah, young children and families that are just starting out. So so that's where it is now. So we haven't defined the start and end time, but at least going with that staggered uh, program is, is what we plan to do, maintain. Six hours. Yeah, six hours. Six hours. Mm -hmm. and, and the other question I had for you is like when you're s surveying specially for space, uh, the way most buildings are that they are at full capacity and a lot of times like you need space for uh, providers like OT, uh, PT, all of this. Are you making sure that we have enough 
extra uh, classrooms? You know how I feel well, about that. So the, the challenge is we can't create and invent spaces, yes. right? So we're, we're always thinking creatively how we can repurpose space and understand that. And I think um, when we get through the, the <clears throat> in, in March 7th and, and as we start to unpack the budget, I think I will give uh, <clears throat> certainly Dr. Walker opportunity just when she reports on the, the student support services budget to talk about where our programs are located and some strategic efforts to kind of really look at space program to optimize the opportunities for students and not into what I would say distribute programs <clears throat> in a way that maximizes our space. The, the challenge in, in many respects is that for some specialized programs, classroom spaces, we need certain square footages, we need access to bathrooms, so that there are a number of factors that go into play when we're thinking about how we kind of account for all the spaces. Uh, so, so uh, I, and I we think still like giving opportunities for our kindergartners to have the same because they need they have the same needs, like the same access. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, for example, we met yesterday with elementary principals to look at our enrollment projections to try to start the conversation about available classroom space. Okay. As we're thinking about expanding the UPK program, we're trying to measure are there at Chatsworth. Or, or, you know, certainly um, Murray or MAS, are there available space that we can shift our thinking about how we deliver this program and meet the obligations around our K-5 programs as well? So, so I, I mean, it does lead us back to what I would say, with a, and I dare say, um, the enrollment task force from years ago, when we really, with the community's help, studied the challenge of available space, configuration models, and creative solutions. One of the things we've learned through this exercise is that many of the providers are looking for local building space, vacant space, so that they can, through a very rigorous, what I would say, approval process, use um, the archdiocese, churches, other areas of, of space to develop programs. And so, th you know, the idea of a hybrid model on e across the district model is something we're considered in the near term and in the long term as well. Okay? Dr. Shops, just for folks listening, can you clarify that there won't be changes to the pre K that we're speaking of the UPK and the differences in the two programs so folks? Yes. So I have been speaking about our universal pre-k program which is a program that is certainly available to families around the application process that it's different from the district pre-k program and i i mean it, it it is a distinct difference within that program and i if it hasn't been clear i want to clarify that this is about universal pre-k which is a long-standing program um, i'm very proud of the fact that this district has really sponsored and supported new pre-k for decades and I think historically the program came out of Head Start and this idea around access to early education which we really believe in and now the challenge is to say how do we maximize the opportunity through the state grant and the significant increase in funding for this program and our subcommittee is really focused on building a program anew and really taking it forward. So. Okay. The second is just a, uh, just an update I mentioned about kindergarten registration, which I talked about that. We continue to, to remind parents that the earlier they uh, start the process, the better for our projections, but also there's a lot of paperwork around the registration process that we uh, have to kind of process. So. Um, don't wait for last minute if at all possible. Um, we talked about the budget development uh, as well. I want to go back to the beginning of the presentation I, because I, I do want to say that it was great to see our Oak Ridge students present today and the seniors. And I didn't have the opportunity to ask Joe Liberti um, what he's learned through the six years of the program. We've had a lot of conversations about what does it take, and, if, and I can harken back to last year when we had our uh, study session on authentic learning. What does it take to really fully commit to and develop this program? How is uh, Joe's kind of experience similar or in some ways different or unique from his colleagues relative to what the preparation looks like, the summer, 
um, the outreach to mentors and really building that model. So one of the things that, you know, the, the board's role in all of this in terms of overseeing program is to tease out and recognize um, what are the resources that are required to really provide the opportunities for students. And Ariana, as you commented, um, this is an incredibly unique program. I've had the opportunity to hear from the Commissioner of Education talking about the importance of supporting civic education and what I've been able to say to my regional colleagues is that we don't learn civics, we do civics in Ameriknick. I think this is an example of that commitment. And so um, as we go through the budget process, it's how do we, we ask those questions about what does it take to support and to grow these types of programs and how do we kind of anchor that in the earlier grades through experiences that will support the process as well. Um, the capital work continues. We're plagued by the supply chain challenge. Um, our co-lab and our colony lab um, is almost at a point of completion. However, we're waiting for um, electrical panels, and so we're not too optimistic for the, a kind of near-term um, celebration of opening those spaces. Um, as Silly mentioned, um, I think one of the things we'll point to and we'll continue to reference as we move closer to the budget vote is that there'll be additional propositions that will go into detail about uh, energy performance and a capital reserve for, um, for, for the turf field that we'll ask our voters to consider as well. So it's going to be important to educate throughout the budget process our, our, our citizens about what this means relative to those propositions as well. Can I ask Sylvia if the capital for the turf will come from fund balances or where is it? Yes. Yes. It is. No. Now it is. Now it is. Okay. Uh, so the reserve for capital is a, um, it's firstly a proposition asking the voters to authorize a certain dollar amount to be um, put in over a certain number of years and through surplus. So, you know, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, but it's typically, you know, a 10 year um, reserve, 10 to 15, you know, 10 year reserve at which point we expect the turf field to be at its end of life. So we're trying to save for it rather than, you know, panic when it's time to replace it. So. Um, the, the only, I think, other thing I wanted to mention, we started our process. This, this is an interesting point in our work. We are still focusing on the here and now, but also planning for next September. Uh, I would say that Dr. Reinhardt has started to activate um, this, well, I would say the search and recruitment process. We've advertised for uh, open positions um, with retirements, knowing that how we can begin to organize committees for searches. Uh, we are about to launch the central um, elementary principal search. And so this is a very busy time for all of us. Um, and just part of the work of Jenny Rodriguez is working with Claire to, f to focus on changes to our recruitment and, and um, search process that really focuses on, aligns with the, the district strategic uh, equity plan and see where we go with that. So there's a lot going on and a lot more to talk about uh, and to report out to the community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna, we're up uh, in terms of um, Board of Education Committee reports. I'm gonna begin with an update on our superintendent search, which I will plan to do um, at these meetings and also stay tuned we'll be adding a tab on our website where this will also be so that you can check in and hear what's going on so the update for right now is um, we had put out an RFP for search firms four search firms submitted um, we the board will be interviewing all four search firms on Thursday at the conclusion of that we will select a search firm and once we have done that then we will make very clear with their help what the process will look like, how the community will be involved, and every step thereafter. And that's what we will, you'll be able to log on and see on our site. Um, so stay tuned, lots more to come on that. Um, we will be as transparent as possible every step of the way. Um, committee reports, anyone in their various committees have anything you'd like to share? So just a brief update on the district equity team, which has been meeting over the past few months to review 
essentially all of the district policies. Um, we are coming together again on Thursday to narrow it down to a list of 10 that we're going to prioritize and submit to the board policy committee for their review and revision over the next few months. Thank you. Um, a quick update on the communications committee. So we met last week and I think um, one of the things that's been brought out at some of the board study sessions is finding uh, curricular information on the websites and so we've been listening to parents on that um, and have started to focus on how do we make the curriculum information that's coming out in the emails that I think has gotten a lot more detailed um, and specific, how do we make that live forever or for, for a good period of time on the website so it's not just sitting in email. So that's something we're thinking about um, as, you know, as we move forward with a number um, of these you know, K2 sessions, 3-5 sessions, um, STEM sessions, that sort of thing. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I just want to, I'm turning to Annie, just board visits. I, I just, I, I remember because I, you had completed the work in conversation with principals. One of the, the um, objectives or responsibility of the board is to really uh, take, make visits to our schools, um, really have an opportunity to look at, in, in I guess, firsthand the progress of our goals. I, I, I just trying to, yep. maybe if you could give an update. Where sure, we're. yep. Um, we created a menu of visit opportunities that stem from the district goals, which I think I sent, um, you know, I think um, we're waiting to share that with the board if it hasn't been shared yet, but um, we have the visit, um, the visit menu set, and I think what we'll do is once the board members respond to that, we'll, I will match you with the appropriate building administrator so that we'll only schedule the visits that you actually are able to make and plan to make, so we're striving for some efficiency there. Great, thank you. And then we'll report back on those. Sure. Yeah, yeah. when we've all done. Any others? Okay. I would open it up to questions from the audience, but that would be odd because there's no one here. Um, <laughs> So, we can bring our own people next time. Um, so I'm going to make a transportation announcement. Uh, residents of the Maranek Union Free School District that wish to request transportation for school-aged children to private and parochial schools must submit their request to transportation at mamkschools.org by 4 p.m. on Monday, April 3rd, 2023. The form is available on the district's website, www.mamkschools.org. To access the form, click the transportation link under the community tab and look for the application link for 2023-2024. To be eligible for transportation, K-8 students must live more than two and less than 15 miles from the school. Ninth through 12th grade students must live more than three and less than 15 miles from the school. New students moving into the school district after April 3rd, 2023 must apply for transportation within 30 days of establishing residency in the district. Parents who are even just considering sending their child to a non-public school should submit an application for every school that they may be considering. All eight applications will be denied. Please note, that as, a, as per the Board of Education, the district does not provide transportation to any student zoned to Chatsworth, Murray, or Central Schools that is accepted into the Dos Caminos program. Upcoming meetings. Tuesday, February 28th, 7 p.m., Board of Education business meeting, tier classroom. Tuesday, March 7th, 7 p.m., Board of Education study session, tier classroom. Tuesday, March 21st, 7 p.m., Board of Education business meeting, tier classroom. Topic 2023-2024 budget. May I make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.